What does your success now say? I'm a reporter journalist. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's always this argument people come to me, should I go to journalism school? Mm -hmm. What do you say to those people who are getting ready to go to the University of Southern California right. or UCLA or NYU film school? And they look at you and there's no school there. You right. were, as they say, quote, self-taught. Mm -hmm. There was a passion to learn, right. a passion to watch, you know. It came out of you early on mm -hmm. falling in love right, with exactly. film. Well, that's the most important thing that I think. To love the business. You have to. You have to. You know, There's I nothing mean, else. You don't know what you'd do if you weren't in film. No, I never set up a situation. I never set up a fallback situation because I didn't want to fall back. <laughs> you know? I yeah. wanted to have to keep eating yeah. at it. You know, And um, uh, actually, that leads me to a point. Let me say this point and then get back to your okay. question, OK? If, if, if there's one thing that I've done that I'm like the proudest of, of everything, all right, is the fact that um, people talk about, wow, you've had such success and it's just been so overnight and whatever. Well, whatever success I've got has come after like eight years of just nothing working out yeah. as trying to get a job in what films. What didn't work out? Well, it's like basically what I tried to do uh, Give was, some sense of rejection. Well, what happened basically was I had tried to make a film uh, uh, it's at around 22, 23. I said, well, you know what? I'm going to make ready. a film. Yeah, I'm ready. Right? <laughs> and I'm going to make, you know, most, uh, I had actually met a, a few different directors by saying I was going to write a book and wanted yeah. to interview them. All right. And so I ended up like talking to them. And they all said that they had made their first films by the time they were 30 or around 30 mm -hmm. years old was when they made their first film. So I thought, well, okay, well, I'm going to beat that. I'm going to make my first film at the time I'm 26. And that was my thing. All right. 26, 26. So I started making this movie. Uh, I just, I came up with the idea for a short film that I was going to shoot. I was going to shoot it on Super 8. Then I ended up getting somebody's 16 millimeter camera. I was going to shoot it that way. And then I, I shot on it for like about a couple of weekends. I thought, well, hell, film's kind of cheap and everything like that. Why don't I just shoot it like a feature? And this was before She's Got to Have It. All right. Not, it was like after Stranger Than Paradise, but before She's Got to Have right. It. And um, so I just started shooting it that way. And I'm like, well, I'm going to make a feature. I'm going to make a 16 millimeter feature, mm -hmm. black and white, and it'll be cool. So I ended up working for like three years on this movie and this was going to be my feature and I right. was like and was financing it from working at a video store so what you means was like I would like get like two hundred dollars or so and then we'd go off and shoot for the weekend and then you know, we'd run out of money and then I would like go back to work again and right. then like eventually I would just keep piecing it together and what you would do is when you'd rent uh, equipment from a rental house if you rent it on Friday you have it all weekend it's kind of this one day yeah, rental right. and you have to return it Monday morning so you would just like just shoot burn like your. I mean, you would just like get old before your time <laughs> yes, trying to like you know shoot all weekend yeah. long and give the stuff back. The, I, I we had I didn't have I had so less so little money that I couldn't even process this footage. All right, that I was in that's way too expensive. All right, mm. so eventually I ended up after like about about three years I ended up like starting processing some of the footage and starting seeing exactly what I had. And guess what? What? I did not have you at all no what I thought I had. All right. It was <laughs> How really, was it different? It was, uh, uh, it was amateurish. Yeah. It was really, and not in a charming way either. And, uh, <laughs> it had no charm. It had no charm at all. All right. And the thing is. No one said, isn't that cute? No, 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 no. It wasn't like that. Now, there were good things about it. All right. You know, I mean, you could tell I made it. Yeah. People who knew me could look at, well, that's that a Quentin, Quentin movie. That. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that has my spirit. You've had that. It has from my day one then. Yeah. But the thing is, though, it just, it was like, this was going to be the thing that, like, set me up, yeah. all right? And I'd worked three years on it. And the, the, I was able to look at it in a, in a realistic way after being horribly depressed for a little bit, but only a short little bit, was the fact that, well, this was my film school. All right, and this was the best film school a person could possibly have. I mean, I actually, instead of like going to school and paying a ton of money to be allowed to use some of their crappy equipment, all right, I actually went out and actually tried to make yeah. make a, a feature film. All right, now I failed. It was guitar picks when I was finished, but when I looked at the footage, now all the stuff I did the first year, which was all the story stuff, all right, yeah. sucked. All right? right, but the stuff that I did, like the last couple of months, yeah. That wasn't something. so bad. Yeah. And what, what made the difference? What did you learn after you got past the story stuff? And is that what is best about even Pulp mm -hmm. Fiction, mm -hmm. where you got beyond mm -hmm. the story stuff? Well, no, to me, I actually, I actually think one of my strongest, my, one of my strengths is my storytelling. Yeah. Because you know, I actually am, am committing to telling a story. It was because just, you're a writer? Um, 
uh, more as a viewer, okay. more bit more the fact that I just like you know I like it when somebody tells me a story and I actually really feel that that's becoming like a, a lost art. But American everybody cinema. says about you. I mean, the, the other than I mean, the things that come out about you. One is a video arcade story, mm -hmm. you know, and and growing up with your mother and loving the movies and seeing. They always talk about carnal knowledge. And <laughs> the other thing that comes out is is when they talk about you. And I want to talk about this a little bit later. But it is that you, in a sense, have taken novelistic techniques. Very much so. Very much and so. And translated them to filmmaking. Yes, to exactly. cinema. No, I know well, that's well. That's the thing is because to me, most movies that you see now—I mean, that used to be the thing about America was the fact that Hollywood. Forget America, Hollywood. Right. Hollywood used to—that's what we did better than anybody else in the world. We told a right. really good right. story. Right. You know, Europe was where you had character-based films or mood-based films, but America, we told the story. We're the worst at it now, as far as I'm concerned. At right. telling a story. I'm telling a story. We don't tell a story. We tell a situation. Most of the movies that you see nowadays, and I'm not a Hollywood basher because enough good movies come out of the Hollywood system every year to justify its existence, you know, but they, without any apologies. However, a good majority of movies that come out, all right, you pretty much know everything you're going to see in the movie by the first 10 or 20 yeah. minutes. Now, that's not a story. A story is something that constantly unfolds. I'm not talking about like this quick left turn or a quick right turn or a big surprise. I'm talking about it unfolds. All right. Yeah, but you don't believe in a linear storytelling. No. Well, it's not. You know, it's not so much I don't believe in it. Uh, it's the situation. Uh, too... I'm, well, it's no. It's it's not the fact that I'm like I'm this big crusade against linear storytelling. All right, but it's the thing is it's not the only game in town. Yeah. All right. I mean, the the bottom line is all right. My storyline jumps all over the place. Right. In back fiction. and forward. Yeah, back and forward. Now the thing is, the truth of the matter is. If I had written Pulp Fiction as a, as a novel, and I was on your show, you would never even remotely bring up the the structure Flashbacks or whatever it. it was. You would you would never bring it up, all right? Because it's like it, a novel can do that no problem. Yeah. Novelists have always had just a complete freedom to pretty much tell their story any way they saw fit, all right? And that's kind of what I'm, you know, that's kind of what I'm trying to do. Now the thing is, for both novels and film. 75% of the stories you're going to tell will work better on a dramatic basis, on a dramatically engaging basis to be told from a linear way. But there is that 25% out there that, you know, can be more resonant by telling it this way. And I think in the case of both Reservoir Dogs and Pulp Fiction, it gains a lot more resonance being told in this kind of, like, wild way.